So we're calling to order the, uh, we call the liquor control board to order first. First yes. up is public comment. It's comment on anything not on the agenda. Not seeing anything flashing and nothing hang, no hands up. How about approval of the agenda? I move, I move the way. Go ahead, Per. <laughs> Uh, I will second Perry's um, motion. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? <clears throat> motion carries. Consider the outside consumption permit for the forge. This is changing the boundaries of where they are now. We have no questions. We'll entertain a motion. Scott's here if you do have any questions, too. No questions, and I'll make a motion to approve the outdoor consumption permit for the forge. Uh, I will second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Next up is the permit for sidewalk florists to deliver beer. Great idea. Yeah. <laughs> the state says it's okay. I guess it's okay. Is that a motion? Yep, motion to approve the sidewalk floors for delivery of beer. I will uh, I'll move that. I'm looking forward to my next bouquet. <laughs> <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Entertain a motion to adjourn? I um, move we adjourn. Okay, I'll second that one. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. We'll call to order the select board meeting. First up is public comment. This is anything not on the select board agenda. Not seeing anything. You got anything there, Trevor? Nope, I don't think so. Okay, move to approve the agenda. I move we approve the agenda. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Go into a public hearing for the USDA grant for Kimball Library. This is a required piece of their USRDA, I think it is, the facilities grant application. It's a chance for anyone who wants to be heard. Anything that you want to consider for public comment? This is their $50,000 grant application. The board authorized the application back in March. Is for ventilation, cooling, heating <clears throat> upgrades. Do we have anybody there with comments? Any board members with comments? Not seeing any. Entertain a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. This is a great pace. <laughs> Next up, we have a consent calendar for, with the meeting minutes and warrants. I move the approval of the consent calendar, meeting minutes of uh, 519 and the warrants. <clears throat> Second that. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next up is business. And first up, we have Sheriff Boniak and Captain Scott Coudier for a sheriff's update. Well, good evening, everyone. This is Sheriff Boniak. And uh, uh, sorry, I'm not there in person, but unfortunately, uh, COVID caught up with me and I've been home quarantined and uh, right now just mild symptoms. So um, hopefully they'll stay that way and we'll get back to work soon. Um, I believe uh, Scott has uh, about a one-year snapshot of the stats, <clears throat> what we have done for the town. That's all, it's arrests, um, incidents, and tickets and warnings. Uh, so if, if we got questions on, one thing I will point out on the, on the incidents, um, if you look at if you look at a copy of it, 
you'll see directed patrols. And what's nice about this is it actually shows um, the date, time, and the address where we did a directed patrol. So um, if you had any questions, if like we were up at the reservoir or um, whether it's the high school or in high school, we've been primarily, it's after school, um, just monitoring speed. Um, so just kind of give you a flavor. Everything we're doing, it's documented. Even, even the warnings, all traffic stops are documented, whether they get a ticket or a warning. And just so you have an idea of about roughly 75% of the people getting stopped in the village are getting warnings. The other 25% are getting tickets. Um, and with the tickets, just so you're aware of this, uh, um, the one-year snapshot, um, any local speed tickets or municipal tickets that are issued, we uh, the village code is on there and the, the village should be receiving 80% um, of any of those violations. And this, the one year snapshot was approximately 80% would be about $8,500. Now that's if the people pay the fines, if they contest it, um, they're found not guilty, um, so or if they just don't pay the fine, but roughly about $8,500 worth of um, violations, local violations should be coming back to Randolph Village. Um, if you look through there, you'll see there's five uh, addresses blocked out and there are sexual assaults on usually any sexual assault, mainly children or pornography. Uh, we wanna protect the victim, so we, we block out the address. Um, and the other thing I just wanna point out with the, when you see it, if you look at the traffic stops, you'll see the date, time, and then the address. The address is actually the actual um, where they're stopped. It may not be the uh, the, the violation uh, where the actual violation took place. Example: Central Street. We have people leaving the village, and we end up stopping them um, by Stock Farm Road. So it'll show traffic stop by uh, Stock Farm Road. The violation was uh, in the village. So just to kind of give you a flavor. Do you have any questions so far? Nothing from me. All right. How about, well, Scott, you want to add anything to this? Uh, no, Sheriff, you covered it pretty well. Um, I provided uh, uh, Kim with uh, these stats earlier today. So I'm hoping that this whiteboard did get those as well. So they, if there is any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. And we can Absolutely. So all together, you're looking around two around two thousand documented incidents slash tickets warnings uh, for a one year snapshot, June to June. Um, I'm I'm open for any questions. Seeing any, I mean, there's been sort of a recent spate of higher profile incidents in other towns combined with some of the stories on challenges in staffing. Are we seeing either or both of those pressures in terms of um, what a reasonable increase? It seems like it's a lot of it's opiate related in that time one in that corridor. Are we seeing any increases or worry about any increases sort of tied to that? I mean, like we seem fairly site specific and not larger. And then how do some of the staffing shortfalls play in or are you just worried about staffing generally? Um, like a lot of law enforcement agencies are statewide and it's probably national. Sure, if I may. Yeah, go ahead. So staffing is always, you know, a problem for, for us. So technically we are <coughs> out of staff. Um, I've got one out on paternity leave and the other one is just finished with the full-time academy. Uh, he'll be back uh, late next month. Um, and then uh, the other deputy gets off the turn to leave for in the beginning of August. So hopefully if uh, they all come back to work, we'll be up full staff and we'll be really good to go. 
Um, we just had another deputy uh, complete her training. We're just waiting on the paper from the academy. Like we get her right on the road as well. So we're looking pretty good staff wise. Um, you know, in regards to high profile incidences, we're not immune to that. Um, we, we've seen quite the increase in you know, narcotic stuff, um, which leads to mental health issues, which leads to domestic, you know, um, or inter driving. Uh, we've seen an increase of that. We've been seeing an uh, increase of the violence of crimes, uh, simple assaults, uh, threats to schools. Um, we've seen quite the uptick of, of that kind of stuff. We, we're a busy department here in the town. When you're talking about the, the staff, and you're talking about the, the staff in here in the village, uh, for the Orange County, for Orange County. Yeah. So that, was more, that was more of a county wide picture. Yeah, so we, we pull you know just about everybody to cover this. Um, we, we've got dedicated deputies that sit here, um, but if they're out for vacation, sick leave, or whatever, we'll pull from within our ranks to come cover down on the, on the ship. Everybody that's in the department is trained to be here, so it's not something out of the norm. It's just not their everyday daily duties. Um, but, you know, like I said, we're, we're off the staff. We're just waiting for those guys to come back in. A moment ago, you talked about, you mentioned the um, mental health responses that you've had. And I've been sort of reading a lot, sort of in a big picture way, about how policing has been sort of responding to increased mental health needs. Um, can you give us any more? background about how you are, you know, your office might be changing its response to how you handle those kinds of calls? We, we definitely changed it a lot. Um, we're, we've really kind of slowed down and we're, we're not going all ways and sirens. We're not trying to more heighten the, the situation. We're all about the, about the escalation um, where we can actually take the time to sit down and figure out what is going on. What resources can we pull in right there on scene? Or where can we bring the patient somewhere to receive more services? We will actually sit down and take that time, whether it's you know 10 minutes, whether it's an hour or more. Uh, we will take that time to figure out what is needed and get the services in play. Um, where opposed, you know, years ago, you good, cool, we're done, and, and then on to the next one. We're, we're, we're taking more time and we're listening, we're de-escalating the entire situation. We're not rushing in with guns drawn. We're, it's a very soft, more softer approach. Every situation that you know, Dick says something different, but normally we'll de-escalate before we, you know, we can figure out what's going on. Is, is that reflecting um, certain um, training that you've received in this specific area in recent years? So all our guys, uh, you know, all done the team two training. Uh, we've had recent uh, mental health updates, uh, you know, that's required by the Vermont Academy. Um, more training is always beneficial and anything that kind of comes out, we point it in, in that direction. So we have that more well-rounded response to these kind of calls for service. So, so Sarah, how is the department feeling comfortable like now with the sort of range of things that you need to respond to, or are there still places where you feel like, boy, I wish we knew better how to do this, or we had more people to do these kinds of things? Like, where, where do you feel like we're at in general? I'm kind of giving you an open ended question here, and, but I'm just kind of get a sense of, you know, where, where, where might we, we might still have some work to do? You know, overall, we're, overall, we're doing pretty well. We're always, we're always open to looking at you know, um, additional trainings, um, you know, Montpelier Police Department is offering what they call CIT. It's a critical incident uh, training. That's, it's basically for mental health. It's a 40 hour course. We'll be looking into that for, for some of the deputies. Uh, right now is a difficult time to send somebody away for 40 hours, uh, but also technology. You know, uh, we we invested in what they call the wrap, uh, bolo wrap. It's a non-lethal. It's it's actually Scott has one on him currently, um, and what it does, um, it shoots out a. It's almost like a weighted fish hooks, two of them, with a Kevlar string in between, 
about a five foot string. And when it fires, it wraps around their, if you, you know, primarily like their legs, it'll wrap around their legs and stop them from, you know, doing anything further. Um, it's a less than lethal technology. That's, it's, it's fairly new. It's been on the market for a couple of years now. And, uh, you know, it just gives us another tool in our toolbox. You know, of course, you know, we have the tasers that we, and anytime we use any use of force, it's all documented. So it's not like we, we just go use it and then no one hears about it. It's everything we do is documented when it comes to use of force. Um, so, but we're making sure we're staying, um, keeping up with technology, find out what's, what works, what doesn't work for, for Randolph. Um, and uh, you, we, we really want that, you know, the, where what Scott was talking about was the communications with people that are especially in distress, you know, taking that time to talk with people and, you know, um, resolving a conflict that it's mutually benefit for everyone, um, you know, and try to get people help. You know, uh, I know, uh, you know, personally, we, I've been on a couple of these calls with Scott and, uh, you know, we actually sat down right outside Gifford on one of the picnic benches. We talked to a person for over half an hour and uh, it really diffused the situation just by, taking that time and talking to people, not just coming in there like Scott was saying, you know, like uh, guns drawn or a tough guy or something like that. You know, treat people like, you know, you'd want to be treated. And um, I think that really goes a long way. So I hope that answers part of your question or all of it. Yeah, no, that's really helpful. Um, when, when, you're, when you're responding to, um, um, to, to calls where there is a mental health aspect. Do you have a pretty clear idea of what you're walking into when you get there or, or you, don't really, you don't really know ahead of time? The fortunate part about having embedded deputies here in the community is we get to know people. Um, and we, so we would have that kind of common knowledge with, if it's a frequent flyer, we, we deal with a lot of people, a lot of times, so if they're in crisis, we know what's kind of going on and how to approach that. Somebody that hasn't reached our radar, and we're always walking in that unknown, um, we may have additional resources coming in. And once we disfuse the situation, we can cancel those, those other resources. I mean, more law enforcement agencies, backup, whatever. Um, but any kind of crisis situation is always an unknown um, until you walk in the door and see what you got. I just want to also point out with that, um, right now, Vermont, we're all on one records management system, RMS. And with, with that, um, we may have uh, someone who unfortunately gets dropped off at Gifford from another uh, location, which happened a, a few times already. They got dropped off from Berlin or somewhere else at the hospital. But... Um, when we find out who they are, you know, we're able to pull up their information because we're all in that one system now, which is, which is great. So um, sharing of information does help a lot. Great. Anybody else have questions? I have, I have a couple more. I don't want to have the whole stage. <laughs> I just have a couple. First, uh, I'd like to know if there's anything the town could do that would help you in your role, not only in the village, but also in the work that you do in the rest of the town. And the second one is, um, I understand there's some congratulations in order for our Sheriff Oniak on a national role he's gonna be playing. So maybe he could tell us about that a little. Um, I'll, I'll, let me, I'll start with this. Um, one of the things I'd like to do, because we do have a good relationship with the town highway crew, I'd like to get the frequencies uh, in our in our in our cruisers. Um, I think that'll be a big help from from us. This way, whether it's winter time or 
you know, car going off the road or something else, we can have that direct communications with the, um, with the highway. And, and you know, thank you for that. Um, so on June 30th of this year, I get sworn in as the president of the National Sheriff's Association. It's, uh, <coughs> excuse me, it's a one-year term. It's an honorary position. It's like, um, it's like being the chair of a select board, but on a national level. Um, I'm not moving anywhere. I'm not going nowhere. My, my family, my roots are here in Vermont, right here in Randolph. I'm very fortunate for my children. We all live in Randolph. And uh, so, uh, yeah, it's just a, it's a, a one year term. And uh, majority of this has been online uh, just twice a year that I have to go over to a, um, Washington, D.C. for a couple of days. And um, this year I'll be going to Kansas City for a few days. I'll be sworn in. But uh, it's here for a rural sheriff being honored on the national level. And it, just proud to be a Vermonter. How cool is that? Little Orange County, Vermont has the national seat. <laughs> Very cool. It is. It's awesome. Yeah. You know, like I said, I'm not going nowhere. I'll be, I'll be here. Um, and uh, like my roots are here, so I'm not going nowhere. Yeah, this is Sonny. Uh, Bill, I'm proud that you're a Rotarian also. Congratulations. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Sonny. Like I always said, it's better to be a part of the community than apart from it. So thank you. <laughs> Great. Do we have any more questions or comments? I think, Larry, you said you had a couple more. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering where we're at with um, the body cameras. So everybody here in the village has body cameras. Uh, I still, we're actually working on a federal grant to supply the entire department with upgraded cameras, um, but everybody here in the village is wearing body cameras. How, how long are the records kept? How is it all, how is the data management handled? So there are, all the cameras here are here at the substation. Um, and we've got uh, several, uh, or just a couple of uh, terabyte hard drives. We even have uh, past history from NLPD when they had their body cameras. So we, we retain those for seven years. Oh, wow. Um, and then we can start moving on. So we'll have you know, the terabyte hard drives stored in, in evidence uh, with years on. That's how we store the body camera data as of right now. Cool. And then my, my last, last um, question is around um, what your policy is around um, non-safety related traffic stops. What was that again? Like, so, what, do we have a, a policy around like non-safety related traffic stops? You know, like somebody who has, a, you know, an ex, you know like, like inspections that are overdue or, and things like that. Do we have a, a policy around when you stop people for those sorts of violations versus, versus when you, you don't stop them or do you, you know, pick those things up with somebody who's already stopped things like that. So just to so be clear, no inspections are safety. I will explain. <laughs> uh, it is a expired inspection sticker. It's a violation of Title 23 uh, for inspired inspection. Um, you, you can't stop that kind of stuff. Um, the, we, we kind of backed off on traffic stops due, uh, due to COVID. Um, but we're kind of ramping up, you know, going back into the traffic stops um, just right because it's when, when, we're, when we're out there making those kind of stops, it's not just, you know, pretextual stops, just stopping people just because there has to be a valid reason why they're being stopped. If it's a safety defect, uh, defective equipment, which is a violation of Title 23, um, it, it's, they're not getting tickets, they're getting warnings. Um, hey, you know, fix, fix your taillight, fix your headlight, um, whatever that may be. It's more of a, hey, just try to get that squared away. Um, in regards to the policy, is, if it's a Title 23 violation, it's, it's very <laughs> And it's up to officer discretion. Mm -hmm. 
Right. Like I said from the beginning, all traffic stops are documented. So whether it's a warning, uh, they may not get a piece of paper, but it is being documented internally. Uh, that's part of the race data collection that we must, you know, we, we must do. So um, it is being documented every stop. Um, And said that during the pandemic, you backed off of some of those kinds of stops, but now they're coming back again. Um, when, when you backed off, did you see any uptick in issues that you feel like you, that you're not, that you were missing that now you're addressing? So we had a lot of complaints in regards to uh, speed violations because we weren't making those stops. We had a lot of violations of people not registering their vehicles, not inspecting their vehicles. Uh, and we didn't do those stops on the safety of us trying not to get COVID. Um, back in the beginning of the pandemic, we we did zero uh, we did zero traffic stops unless it was a major major uh, motor vehicle violation, or we thought that the operator may be impaired. Um, out of the abundance of trying to keep our department safe, and so, um, we had kind of winging in this kind of pretext right now. Um, more officers are stopping vehicles and things of that nature. That's why we're increasing more on that traffic stop level due to the pandemic time and not being around and everybody's been vaccinated. That's the reason behind that. Thank you. I, before we before we move on, I just want to say that um, in the in the three plus years now that you, you all have been um, working in, in the village, um, taking over from our now defunct department. Um, I, I, the, the vast majority of the feedback I've gotten from the public has been overwhelmingly positive. And just want to put that out there that um, that it's it, by all accounts it's it's been a positive change. And uh, thank you for the you know that good work that has uh, you know gotten that kind of response from the public. So thank you very much. Thank you for that comment, and we uh, we do try. We want to make sure, you know, we're we're fair, and uh, you know, we're still enforcing the laws, but making sure we're doing it in a fair, practical way. Um, you know, we we're all human; we all make mistakes. You know, and as far as the on the traffic tickets, you know, we do look at you know the the demeanor at the stop uh, of the person, the operator. Uh, if they got previous violations, uh, and uh, so we do take a lot in consideration. But you know, we try to work with people, and uh, that goes for everything we do down there. And it's we want that throughout the county. So uh, thank you for that comment, and we truly appreciate it. And we appreciate the support of all the select board members. Thank you. Great. Do we have any more questions or comments? Not seeing any. Great. Well, thanks for your time. Thank you. You're welcome to join us for the rest of our agenda. I'm or you're gonna... welcome to go back to recovering. I'm going to go out tea. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next up is the Chamber of Commerce request for a banner. Hi there, it's Andrea. I'm here. Okay, let's uh, hang on. Let Trevor give us a little bit. Uh, yep, sorry, we were trying to fix. We got, it seems that the internet connections are a little, uh, a little wonkier tonight, so we have some freezing. Uh, something tied to that, which make sure we're all plugged in and everything. Um, what you have before you for this one is a request to put the banner across uh, Main Street, uh, advertising the Fourth of July events. Uh, as I understand, this is the same location or similar location as prior years. Andrea is here on behalf of the Chamber of Commerce and can answer some questions related to that. The sign ordinance requires the select board to bless any requests for banners and a few other more technical requirements with it, such as certificates of insurance, plans for installation and removal, um, and sort of clarifying that once that banner is up, um, 
it's the responsibility of the banner owner and of the town um, to just put it up to maintain it to take it back down. So that's the <coughs> we had a we had some issues there with the anchors in the buildings um, and whatnot. So I would assume at that point the town said we were not responsible for the anchors or anything to do with those. So does that, does the new application that they submit make whoever's hanging the banner responsible for how they get it up there and any damage that might happen to the buildings it's connected to? We've got a recommended motion before you that would include provide a plan for installation, maintenance, and removal of the building. Um, and then the commercial general liability insurance requirement along with it. And so that could be part of, of, a, of an approval that there is that kind of plan and awareness in addition to whatever's already in the sign ordinance. Okay. And how does the, the Andrea can tell us how the sign is, how they plan to get the banner up there? In the past, the Randolph Center Fire Department has assisted in raising it. So we're going to address them again after this meeting if we get the approval to hang it. From my understanding, from our conversation at our meeting a couple of weeks ago, um, the anchor on the Red Lion Inn has been replaced in accordance to a um, building code. Um, Julie Ifland, are you on this meeting? I don't know. So part of the issue, Andrea, is the town didn't want any liability for anything to do with the banners being hung up there. So right. the fire department was not an option hanging these oh. banners. Okay. Um, we didn't want the liability of the town being the one that put it up. So I'll have to refer back to Linda on that. Um, Cause that's what she spoke about when we met. So if we do that, we, we have a um, insurance policy for the day of the event on the 4th of July. But you need I'll to have to have see. one that covers the, any damage that might happen from the banner. That's what we have to check out if we are able to extend that policy to that banner to include the time that it would hang there. So you're saying that we cannot ask services of the fire department because they're part of the town of Randolph. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Well, um, I, I can't do any, I can't give you more information than that at the moment. And I have to go answer those questions before we can make any confirmation on hanging a banner. Is that, do you agree? Um, I think before you can answer the questions, what we need to take action on this tonight, if you're going to be able to hang the banner, because we <coughs> meet until after the fourth. That's right. So I think that maybe we need to look at whether we approve this as long as you guys can provide proof of insurance that covers the banner and the event and have a way to we have the event coverage certificate already. I can get that to you. I think Trevor, did did you get that, Trevor, from Linda already? Uh, I haven't seen it yet. We made a request this afternoon, a follow up request for it. So I okay, did. all right. She's taking care of a friend who had eye surgery today, so um, I will talk to her tomorrow about that. But yeah, I know that the certificate is valid and ready because we spoke of it the other day. Shall I get back to you by Monday? Well, you got to wait and see if the board puts a motion through first. Uh, Trini, I'd like to, uh, this is Tom Harris, I'd like to make a motion that we approve the banner contingent upon receipt of a uh, certificate of insurance uh, from the chamber that the uh, any any damage that re, uh, results from the banner is included in the uh, coverage for the 4th of July event. Okay. Do you want to, does the town care how they get it up there? I don't think we do. Right? No, I mean, so long as it's, it's not a town entity that's putting it up there, right? 
I don't think we need that in the motion. I, I, no, I don't think so. Right. Yeah. Are there any suggestions on how we might get it up there? If the town. Uh, hang on a minute, partner. Andrea. We've got a motion on the floor. Do we have a second on it before we bring it up for discussion? I'll second it. Um, okay, all those in favor? Aye. Um, aye. Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Anybody have any recommendations? Sure. I think there's a few electricians with bucket trucks and carry yeah. stuff lift. Oh, that would be awesome. If someone well, has a good suggestion, um, I'm all ears. Well, I'll check with Harmony Electric because they were the ones that helped like put the lights on the Christmas tree. So they've got a towable lift that maybe okay. they've done. Yeah. Harmony. Okay. Thank you. Great. Next up is a conversation with Sarah of Vital Communities on the White River Valley Working Communities. Hey, that's me. Yep, Sarah's here with us in the room and she's in the front row and ready to go, I think. <laughs> yeah, thanks, thanks for having me, everyone. And I apologize for my cough. My seasonal allergies are really terrible this week. Um, <clears throat> that's a brochure about the White River Valley Consortium Working Communities Challenge. And a lot of you are probably familiar with it already since Randolph has been the driving factor. So I'll just do the really short recap summary of it, and then I'm happy to answer any and all questions you have um, about the project. So the short summary is that um, the Working Communities Challenge is a grant and technical assistance program that's coordinated by the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston, and it's meant for communities in Vermont. They run this in a couple of other states too, and the Vermont version is for communities in Vermont to um, collaboratively work on any economic opportunity, community development issues that they identify together. So the other piece of this grant program is that um, municipalities with less than 5,000 residents were, encouraged, were actually required to band together to form a larger regional entity. So back in 2019, it was actually the town of Randolph that really spurred the creation of the White River Valley Consortium in order to take advantage of this opportunity. So Josh Jerome and then um, in partnership with Rebecca Sanborn Stone, who's a community organizer in Bethel, reached out to surrounding towns in the White River Valley and invited town neighboring towns to join in this consortium in order to participate in this grant opportunity. Um, it's also a two-phase grant program. The first phase was a planning phase. So the town of Randolph actually served as the fiscal agent for the uh, planning award. And Josh was leading that project during the planning phase. So that was from 2019 through the end of last year, roughly. COVID missed a few timelines up in there. Um, and then at the end of last year, the consortium, so over, over the course of the planning phase, the consortium was like, in, engaged in deep discussions on what issues should we even work on in this really open-ended grant program. And after a lot of conversation, ended up selecting um, increasing the amount of housing that's affordable for entry-level workforce and beginning entrepreneurs. As we all know, there's a huge housing crisis. There's a lot of different issues we could have worked on. There's a lot of different, a lot of different challenges that were identified. Um, but the group really felt that housing was A, one of the most pressing, and B, one of the ones where the foundation was actually in place where we actually could do something about it, rather than some opportunities that were too, some challenges that were too big to even really Feel like we could tackle in this three-year grant program. Um, happy to talk more about wh why that topic came up, but the short version is that last fall we submitted an application as a consortium to the implementation phase of the Working Communities Challenge Program, and we were awarded this implementation grant. So I mentioned the town of Randolph had been the fiscal sponsor during the planning phase, but for the implementation phase, Vital Communities is actually the fiscal sponsor. However, the town of Randolph has stayed a core team member and Josh was a member of the steering committee up until the day of his departure. Um, <laughs> so the grant funding includes uh, of supporting a variety of different um, bits and pieces of staffing, including a full-time coordinator for the consortium for this work. And that's me. So I am actually a community member. I live in Royalton and I have been a part of the consortium during the planning phase. And in January, I was hired to be the coordinator for this work. So we've spent the last few months um, really getting our ducks in a row logistically and um, 
now we're at this point where we're ready to start working directly with the communities again, including with all of the select boards. So there's really like three different buckets in which we're planning to work with the town of Randolph. We're working with community members as volunteers in terms of collecting input from your residents. I've also talked with Trevor about um, stepping into Josh's role on the steering committee. And then the third bucket is that we really are trying to connect with the select boards of all 14 of the towns that we're serving as well, which is why I'm happy to talk with you tonight. Um, and then that's, that's really the, there's a lot of things we would like to work on with the select boards, but that first step, that really specific request tonight is about this June 30th workshop, which is really the first opportunity to bring the select boards together hear from the Federal Reserve Bank staff about this program and what this working communities challenge really is, and then start talking with each other and figure out where, where to go from there. So it's like the really quick <laughs> speed through summary of that. And I am, yeah, I'm here to really answer any questions you have and, and you know, start the conversation about how you all would like to work with us as a select board. And then also Trevor, like I said, Trevor and I are having a conversation about um, having Randolph represented on that steering committee. I have a question. Um, I, I read the the, um, the sort of introductory documentation that was sent along to this meeting, and it, it all sounds good. It makes sense, but it's all kind of abstract. Yeah. And so I, I left it. I left thinking, like, how? Where does this really go? How does it get implemented? What What are the kinds of things that we not necessarily expect to see, but like could possibly see, like as products, like just yeah. like kind of like even if it's like something which never happens, just as an example of like what the possibilities are in terms of where we can end up when we're done with this process. Yeah, absolutely. That's a very valid question. And um, yeah, so it's a, so the implementation phase is a three-year award and it's an extremely flexible grant program. So they really understand that it takes a while to build the relationships and really scope out what exactly to work on, which is why I don't have a concrete answer for you yet about what we're working on. Um, where we're at currently as a consortium is that we just launched really two separate tracks of information gathering. One of them is looking at what are some of the concrete housing solutions out there that other people are doing and teaching ourselves about them essentially so that we can understand whether they would even be applicable here. The other track is community outreach to really do really deep and robust engagement with members of the White River Valley to figure out what are the real I mean, the challenge is here, but also what are the opportunities and what would we actually want to see, not just what the challenges are in terms of number of units. We know that already. So those two information gathering tracks will run concurrently for a few months to the remainder of the year and then dovetail it, at which point we'll make collectively make a decision about what projects to actually work on. So that's the process for getting there. But in terms of your question about what type of things are we even talking about, I can say that that project exploration track, that first track, has started trying to understand more about solutions like support programs for supporting accessory dwelling units. That's a really promising solution, but it can be really hard for individual homeowners to do alone. There's some really interesting models in Vermont and around the country of municipalities, nonprofits, et cetera, supporting homeowners in doing, um, in, in doing that, in building accessory apartments. Um, we're looking at, um, uh, solutions around like if there's core properties in a, in a downtown area that's really important to a town are there creative uh, public private partnerships that could be used to actually turn those sites into housing we're looking at new uh, new forms of ownership models such as co-ops um, we're looking at tools that might not necessarily build more units but make it more equitable who can access existing units for example um, a model called a preferred renter certificate program. It's actually, there's an instance of this in the shop in the Champlain Valley here in Vermont. And it's a training program for first time renters or renters who are um, coming out of incarceration, for example. And it's a training program for the renters, but at the end, they also receive a preferred renter certificate. And there's landlords in the area who've agreed to give priority to those tenants, which can add a lot of security for the landlords people who want to help their community and are just nervous about managing unknown tenants um, while also helping people get a leg into the market. I mean, thinking of our specific focus area being on housing for entry-level workforce, if you have an 18 or a 22-year-old who has no tenant history, how can we help them actually be competitive in 
competing for our short supply of apartments. So models like that as well as ones that increase the number of units. Um, th there's a lot more. We, I've got a running list of 30 plus solutions that people have suggested to us, but those are just some of the highlights I've got across the spectrum. Okay. No, thanks. That's really helpful. And I will also say um, RACDC, Julie Iflin is an active member of the steering committee as well. So we're definitely drawing on her expertise from her work. So. Any other questions? I don't see any questions. I think what you're looking for is a board member to volunteer. So if none of the ones present want to volunteer, the one that's not present could be volunteered. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. So that June 30th workshop will be, um, I don't think I had this information pinned down yet when I sent that email, but it'll be, it'll be located at the Bethel Town offices, so not that far away, and it will be an hour agenda with an optional half hour beforehand of refreshments and networking. So trying to keep it reasonable for the folks we're asking to attend. What time of day is it? Um, we have it it's in the evening. So we haven't pinned down the exact start time yet, but that hour and a half will fall somewhere between six and 8.30. And that's a Thursday. Would this be an ongoing um, responsibility to the committee, or just this one? Yeah, I think that, that so we definitely want an ongoing relationship with the select board, but the person who attends that June 30th workshop doesn't have to be the ongoing point person for this work. <laughs> I mean, especially if Trevor gets involved, yeah. We really just want it to be an opportunity for to make sure the select boards get the chance to hear directly from the working communities challenge staff and also to meet each other just to have touch points with as we try to work collaboratively on this issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, if nobody else is chomping at the bit, I'd be willing to attend that meeting. Okay, Larry. There you go. <laughs> So you'll, you'll, you'll let me know exactly when. Yes, yeah. We should have that pinned down within the next week. Okay. Yeah, no, that evening is fine. Just kind of, you know, the exact time. Okay. 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 All right. Any other questions before we move to the next item? All set? Great. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Sarah. Next up, we have an appointment to the Water Wastewater Committee. Yes. Um, the Water Wastewater Committee right now has uh, four. Sorry, I'm updating my calendar here. Okay. Um, right now, we have four members on our committee, and um, one of our members is um, spends part of the year outside of the country. And so that sometimes leaves us with three members, um, which is really not adequate for uh, 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 our committee. So um, I have found a, a potential uh, new member is um, Stephen Wright. He is a, a neighbor of mine. He is a recently retired um, geologist from the uh, University of Vermont, having taught there for many years. and. Um, He's an engaged community member. He's the person who's been running our Green, green Up Day for several years now. And um, it seems like having a geologist on uh, our committee couldn't, couldn't be a bad thing. And um, he's uh, super smart, easy to work with, upstanding, fine human being. And uh, mm -hmm. I'd love to see him be appointed to, uh, to join us in the committee. Okay. Any questions from anyone? If not, any motions? And I'll make a motion to uh, nominate Steve Wright to the wastewater water wastewater committee. I'll second. A motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carries.
Next up, we have authorization of the tax anticipation note. Yep. This is oh, just the RFP. Yeah, just permission to essentially publish the RFP. There are some dates we've got to, to block out um, just in terms of when it goes out and comes back. We're slightly ahead of last year's schedule, but not a ton. Um, the amount envisioned since early in the budgeting process for fiscal 23 is 1.5 million. That's the number you see reflected in the budget. Uh, we do publish this um, for the policy um, where we can, but we do have a bank contact tech list, all the normal players. There's, so there's at least seven of them on there and we send it directly to them as well. Uh, and that helps us with a kind of a quick turnaround time. So it's just blanking out the dates once we get the approval. And then we just got to figure out um, how to finish the, the cash flow exercise for fiscal 23 with all the comings and goings and, and, and transition stuff. So, um, we've got a few different ways to get it done. It's not exceedingly difficult. Okay, want to put a motion out to issue the RFP? All right, you knew that. Motion to, uh, motion to approve the RFP for the tax anticipation now. And I'll second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstained? Motion carries. Next up is the RFP for paving projects. Yeah, same idea, just for the amount being in excess of the thresholds in the policy. We're seeking permission to publish the RFP a little bit ahead of last year. Remember last year, we actually went out sort of two separate rounds um, and we're successful on the second round getting through theirs. Um, we use the uh, enhanced list of contacts again. We'll publish it, but again, probably another eight to 10 direct contacts will get this on the usual players. Um, we have um, the highway crew went out, looked at those, did an inspection, thought about um, experience from a uh, uh, Condition and maintenance standpoint, um, where are we at? What could really uh, benefit from some kind of treatment? Uh, what areas and how does that tie in to all of these other factors without disrupting the long term planning idea? So, the list you have in front of you in the table uh, reflects that exercise. In the capital improvement plan, plan we had thought that we might do a, a larger kind of reclamation repave project out on East Bethel Road, but as they looked at it, a, a little more. There were two sections in particular that they thought um, an inch and a half you know, shim, so you can know, level everything out, and an inch and a half overlay. Some of the what we did on Western School might be uh, a, a good treatment option for these areas for this year. Got a useful life of five years. Depends on traffic and all that stuff for the shim and overlay. It's a good entry point into that. Um, there are the two areas on East Pepper Road, so that's still in the mix. Um, the shorter one is up in that section between the uh, along with the front of the DPC campus right there for that um, first scene at the intersection. Um, but the schoolhouse and the second piece of it, the longer piece, if you think you go all the way down to the Crocker Road end where that kind of weird intersection triangle piece is, you work back from there to sort of the next pavement scene. I looked it up on our I guess the Richardson Farm, the White Farm, kind of up. If you're headed toward DPC, kind of up uh, a little bit on the hill. Um, so it would be that section there, and those were the two that they thought would benefit the most from that. Some of the other areas we've, um, you know, you've got rutted and or broken up pavement, and so with some of the spots even on Main Street, for example, we've had a really difficult time with um, the icing and you know, ice control measures. It's been difficult to sweep some of those wheel ruts. Um, so we've had to go through a couple of times. That's why you still see residual stuff. It's kind of a blow it out, pick it up, blow it out, pick it up exercise um, that, that happens there. Um, and so all of these other pieces have that kind of component to it. Maple Street, which we talked about way back at the scoping study, 
is on here recognizing that we're probably since we've been saying three to five years out for a complete project and i think five is might be the more risk realistic time frame given the anticipated cost so given the condition there even though we've done some spot treatments um, that would really benefit from something a little uh, more durable and a little more comprehensive uh, so it's about 19 a little less than 19,500 linear feet um, we were thinking originally that about 335 for the East Bethel piece um, using last year's tonnage figures and some rough pavement calculator applications that are out there. This, this could be more than that. I think 375 um, would be a baseline based on last year prices. And again, who knows where they'll end up. Um, we do have uh, a pretty healthy reserve balance in the paving reserve coming out of last year. So that if we did go up the comment wall at least this would be three big jumps now at once. We certainly could do that without disrupting the kind of long term plan up to a certain amount, obviously if we decided to, to come close to emptying that reserve out for the next future years a little more complicated. Plus there's another hundred thousand dollars shed that's going to transfer to that reserve after July 1 as part of the budget process. So it's, there's a little bit of a replenishment mechanism already already put up. So this would be the, the, the list. Obviously we see what comes back as prices are in excess of what what we're willing and able to do and we have to try to figure out which among these is the most important for us to do in fiscal 23. Prioritize that work from there. So working, I think, to do the long term in a more key year plan. Do some staff stabilization for the project plan for these types of things. We have that completed in the process, but we will have that completed for the next cycle of this. Day. So this would just be authorization to have us put these out to bid. And the bids go out, they also include uh, just sort of any intimidation shoulders and, and long term disturbs. And, Testing water, wastewater, and stormwater rises in the infrastructure, such as that. So, there are a couple of other pieces that go with it. Um, we may put in you know, pre paint stop bars or any other kind of infrastructure like that, yeah. or we may do those ourselves. I think that help us help you keep supply and we will practice that. And so, it's kind of talk with John to see which way they want to go. There are a few other pieces. The system. Is it possible to incorporate um, any kind of speed control on any of these roads where we might have complaints since while we're doing this work? Such as a speed hump or a bump out? Or? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it, it's possible there would be a cost. And I think there might be that larger conversation about the effectiveness, especially with speed hump. How, is, how effective is it versus what does it create from a Pavement management. Okay. You know, other safety factors have, you know, it, it, the struggle with the ones on school streets, there's a little bit of a push pull that they may help control speed, but I've really complicated some of the maintenance challenges there. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and so I think when we think longer term about speed control, we think about some of these projects, it might be adding other traffic climbing elements, such as safe on paths or narrowing or those types of things. On, once you get off kind of and those sort of side or other accessory streets. Mm -hmm. um, on Salisbury Street, mm -hmm. um, if I remember right, the length of that street is privately owned. Um, are, we, are we paving that section? Like how, how do we, like, what's our relationship with maintenance and the private nature of that stretch of road? Yeah, I, I have to admit that I. I don't know the details of that. We put that in there as it's one of the sections that is heavily used in, in most in need. And if we include it in the table, we can get it rolling and um, can sort that out or have that conversation about is it worth it as a public investment? They put that part of that because privately owned. That's a, that's a main, pretty heavily used in the repair. So, yeah. It, no, it's a good question. To which, to, yeah, to keep in mind, you know, for which John and I just uh, don't have enough of the historical knowledge to be able to say, you know, things a little bit. So. 
We have a proposed list of paving locations and a request to put them out to bid and then evaluate what comes back. Any other comments on it? Not any motions from the board? I'd like to move that we uh, okay the RFP for the proposed list uh, and uh, ask for a second. I'll second that. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Next up, we have the um, ratifying the vote to purchase the fire truck. So this is the follow-up to this conversation started at your May meeting with uh, a blessing for Chief Taylor and his folks over East Randolph about the price, different options, and the in between, they were able to find one for a new pumper tanker truck. Uh, the cost of that truck is a little more, a little less than $350,000 for all of the pieces that's going to be through the Sourcy. Sourcy Emergency Equipment, wherever they're full time. They're primarily based out of St. Albans, where they have some, you know, some of the business they work as Florida. The folks we deal with are, are from north and west. Um, so for this new truck and chassis, um, we do have enough in that fire equipment reserve. Um, we are $543.19 to the good if you spend every, everything else on this truck. So um, probably another $110,000 going over in fiscal 23 as the reserve transfer. Um, do that. Yeah. And so there is again that same replenishment mechanism following right behind it. Plus, this truck would be a fiscal 23 purchase, so it actually happened after July 1. And then delivery is still, I think, if I'm rem remembering all the conversation correctly, there's some hope that it's delivered in 23, but it could be as late as early 24. And part of the reason for the cycle is that um, we wanted to do this sooner than later, so it's even further out than that. Um, if action is, is deferred or, or otherwise delayed. We've seen this with all kinds of pieces of equipment from the, the dump trucks to, to everything else. Um, they didn't touch on it, but Scott and, and Bill were, are seeing this with cruisers to 18 to 20 months out um, in the best case scenario. So there is kind of a time component to having done this now. You have offered your provisional authorization for this. Um, so this would be formalizing that action. So just to clarify, um, the body is already at the shop. They're waiting just for the chassis to arrive and that's anticipated to be there early fall. If it arrives on time, we will have the truck by January or February. If we ordered from spec, we're now out the 20 to 24 months. So entertain a motion. Sure, I'll move to ratify the purchase of the fire truck. Second. Motion and a second, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. And right on time, I see Mr. Brady in the audience. He is our next agenda item. Excellent. Nice to see you, Trevor. Nice to see you, Trini. Thanks for having me today. And uh, I am joined here by uh, Kelly Hotek. Kelly, you want to come forward and hang out with me up here? Absolutely. <laughs> I'm going to get your title wrong, but I believe you are the uh, director of underwriting. Not quite yet. Okay. We'll call we'll, 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 <laughs> senior underwriter marketing rep. Senior <laughs> underwriter and marketing rep. But I'm Ted Brady. I'm the executive director of the Vermont League of Cities and Towns. I think the owl is picking me up, and you can see me, right? Yep. 
Uh, and I'm here really for one simple reason, uh, which is uh, to thank uh, the town of Randolph for being a member of the league, but also, uh, I guess I'm here for two reasons, but also kind of a call to action to try to make sure that uh, Randolph knows uh, what the league needs from you folks right now to make sure that we're successful as a team. Uh, and so I wanted to quickly go through a couple of things about what the league's up to and then uh, talk a little about passive and what passive is up to, uh, and then hopefully just take uh, some questions and answers. And hopefully this is 15 minutes of your time, not more than that. So hold me to it. I do have um, a presentation, which I'll uh, leave a few copies with Trevor uh, and, and share electronically in case you wanna share with the board. But just to remind everybody what the league is, we are your member owned association all 246 cities and towns, soon to be 247, thanks City of Essex Junction. Uh, <laughs> some intimate knowledge in this room of that fun. Uh, all 246 cities and towns <laughs> are members currently. Uh, it's been that way for about uh, 40 years, which is pretty exciting. In addition to that, we have another 142 other municipal members like your CUD, your Communications Union District in this region, your Solid Waste Management District, your county, all those wonderful things. Uh, we we here we're here to we exist to serve and strengthen you. So if that's not how you perceive us, I need to know that <laughs> because that is the sole reason we exist. Uh, we do that through five key, key areas. We provide uh, support, uh, and the biggest way we do that is through the Municipal Assistance Center and the Municipal Inquiry Service. If you're curious, uh, this is where we get about four thousand. Uh, member inquiries a year from select board members, planning commission members, managers, administrators. Uh, we're getting about 10 a year from Randolph. So about 10 emails and phone calls picking up and saying, hey, how do you, how do I do this? What's going on? How do you run, deal with this open meeting law issue? Things like that. Uh, we provide knowledge and we do that through trainings. Uh, a lot of virtual trainings lately, uh, but as I think many of you probably know, uh, well, back in March, we did an open meeting law training with you folks uh, for your town officials. Uh, and so we do, that's the second thing, knowledge. Uh, we represent you. I'll talk about that in a few moments in the State House and down in D.C. Uh, as Kelly will talk, we provide you insurance. And then finally, we're really about connection. I just came from the downtown conference in St. Johnsbury, where, you know, there were about, I don't know, five or six dozen municipal officials uh, getting together to talk about uh, they're downtowns, which I know you folks are proud of yours. We just finished a strategic planning process, which a few of you, a few of you were involved in. We did a member survey. We did some outreach to our staff. We did uh, some listening sessions. And we came up with these four key things where we're going in the future. And I want to just review them for you real quickly. We're focused on growing a member-focused organization, a sustainable and relevant member-focused organization. What does that mean? It means asking less from you in dues and uh, trying to find other creative revenue sources so that we can continue to serve you. We're here to strengthen the capacity of local government. It's getting more complex. We need to provide more offerings. A big area, which I'll talk about in a moment, IT, uh, HR, name, the, things are not what they were 20 or 30 years ago. We need to develop and attract an outstanding uh, talent pool and workforce for you. So. This is an area that you cannot, no municipality can do this alone. People don't think about coming into municipal government necessarily when you come out of high school in Randolph, right? And we want to change that. We want people to think not just about how cool it would be to be a firefighter or a uh, police officer, but it's a pretty incredible opportunity to be in finance in a municipality, to be in public works. These are good paying jobs with a secure retirement, unlike some of the other retirement systems uh, around the country. Uh, and that. Uh, we need to develop that pipeline. And then the fourth area that we're really trying to help you with, which is new, is championing inclusive and resilient communities. This is an area the league has not worked in before, but we're really trying to, to move there. So a couple of quick facts as to what you're paying for. Last year, I mentioned we did about 4,000 municipal inquiries. The number just keeps going up and up. Uh, our friends in the insurance, the pool, sorry, the risk pool that uh, Kelly represents, returned $3.1 million in member equity, which means your, your cost of your insurance was not your personally, but to the entire portfolio was $3.1 million less than it would have been otherwise because of member equity being returned to you instead of profit going to the insurance company. 
that's double uh, the largest return to our members we've ever done, $3.1 million. Uh, our, uh, we created a new program, the ARPA program, the American Rescue Plan Act Assistance and Coordination Program. People from Randolph have talked to Katie Buckley, our uh, the director of the program. She managed 2,000 inquiries uh, in the last year, just about the American Rescue Plan. Uh, we're getting uh, more than a quarter million views at the uh, webpage at vlct.org. A lot of that has been COVID related in the last year. So I hope you managed to use that. And then I, I think the thing I'm most proud of recently is uh, that ARPA money you did receive was not a sure thing. You know, uh, that money, about two thirds of it was supposed to go to the counties and the uh, treasury department made a decision that uh, Vermont had county government and we had to advocate on our behalf to explain the reality with our congressional delegation governor that $200 million shouldn't be going to the counties. It should be going to our municipalities. A couple of highlights of things we're working on right now that I wanted you to know about. Uh, one is IT services. So we did a member survey uh, about uh, a year ago and asked our members what they're struggling with. And I hope some of you responded to that survey. And uh, we found kind of three key things. Uh, number one, IT. Uh, number two, cybersecurity. Uh, number three, information technology. <laughs> so uh, this seems to be the biggest pressing issue for our municipalities right now, dealing with IT. And we acknowledge it. We're working on it. We just finished up a project with Champlain College uh, to do an assessment of our membership and find out what they needed. And uh, as a result, uh, the league published an IT services options catalog on our website just about a month ago, an IT services RFQ template, and a sample RFQ. So if Town of Randolph decides it wants to go out for a uh, bid for managed IT services, we now have a model, a model uh, RFP for you. You all know that that's something we do really well. We create model policies and model RFPs really well. That's just the beginning. There's more. And my call to action will focus on that in just about two minutes, I promise. Uh, another area we've been spending a lot of time on is diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, when I got here, we had just formed a committee, an equity committee. It's made up of about uh, two dozen local officials. And we're trying to help towns bat, you know, battle through a really difficult conversation. Uh, and so you should check out our website at vlct.org backslash DEI. Uh, we have we're about to publish a toolkit in about two weeks that can help towns, you know, how do you form an equity committee? What are definitions? What's some reading material? What's a model declaration of inclusion? So Randolph, uh, did you guys adopt, have you guys adopted a DOI or? We did a localized version last summer. Excellent. So you guys are ahead of the game of, uh, you know, you're amongst the top, what, 75 or so that have done so. We're also about to launch a, a welcoming communities cohort. So if Randolph's interested in applying for this. We're hiring a consultant to do some cohorting of other communities that are trying to work on just making sure their communities are welcoming. We're asking select board members and managers to participate. And we've also partnered with the Vermont Community Foundation and the state of Vermont to create a grant program that people can apply for up to $10,000 to, uh, to do equity work in their town. So pay attention to that stuff. I, I promise you I only have two slides left in my presentation. I want to get to representation really quick. We had some enormous successes in the state house this year. I think a lot of people did. The legislature generally uh, performed well. It turns out when there's not a scarcity of money, uh, people can get along really well. And so in that eight point some odd billion dollar budget, 25% bigger than a typical state budget, typical year, there are a couple of things I want you to know about. One is H518. Uh, which now has an act number that I do not know because it's been signed into law, I believe. Uh, it's the Municipal Energy Resilience Grant Program. This is a uh, $45, $46 million pot of money to help communities uh, across the state do energy assessments of municipal buildings and then implement energy uh, retrofits, fuel switching. Electronic vehicle, electric vehicle stations, go down a long list of things. Grants of up to a half million dollars per community to do the implementation, $5 million to do energy audits, not per community, but 
Uh, you'll be able to apply through BGS, we think towards the end of the summer for energy audit money. And then sometime in the winter, we expect uh, that a $36 million pool of money for implementation to be available. And the Regional Planning Commission's got $2 million to uh, help you apply for that funding. The number one criteria by which you will be competing is your energy burden. And I can tell you that Randolph is not in the worst shape, but it's not in the best shape either. So you're of the 270 some odd municipal entities that are scored, I think Randolph's right about 100. So you have a chance of accessing some of that 40 some odd million dollars, and I encourage you to do so. The other exciting thing this year that municipalities need to know about, and all of this is in addition to the you know, $100 million in water and wastewater money, uh, $50 million in new housing money. Uh, there, there's a lot of economic development money. Now. This is specific to municipalities. Uh, there's a $40 million community recovery and revitalization grant program uh, that municipalities can apply for economic development. So I just want to flag that one for you. ACCD will be running that, and I think that'll be coming out in the next uh, probably three months. We had big success on a new municipal authority bill, S-181. Uh, and this municipal authority bill uh, is, uh, this is a step. You know, we, we, fought, we fought in that legislature for, I don't know, 60 years about local control. And we finally said, this makes no sense. Let's find a happy place. And so the idea is we've gone to the legislature, we're gonna do it every year and say, here's a bunch of stuff that we'd like you to give towns the authority to do using ordinance authority. Um, uh, and instead of fighting for their you know, right to do it period, we're just trying to get you some ordinance authority for things like eliminating offices like constable, for things like uh, deciding that you don't want your, you wanna allow non-residents to serve on boards. Things that otherwise you'd have to go and either get a charter change or get an act of the legislature period. So we had some good luck there. We moved that. Then there's the stuff that we, um, well, I should also point out that we expanded the Think Vermont recruitment incentive to include municipal employees, uh, including law enforcement. Um, and we created a federal assistance program with a little funding so that we're going to help you navigate with the RPCs the uh, infrastructure bill. And then there's a list of things that we successfully made not happen. And perhaps the biggest one there is preserving qualified immunity for law enforcement officers, uh, which is not uh, wrapped up, but it's certainly on its way. The end of session report, which some people really love, is gonna be published tomorrow. So watch your email uh, boxes, uh, because that should show up sometime midday tomorrow. And that will be a weekend read of all this wonderful stuff. So my final thing is a call to action. And that call to action, number one, is if you are not getting VLCT emails, we send three specific types of emails. The VLCT news, it comes out bi-weekly. Uh, we send a monthly journal. Uh, and then we send the legislative advocacy updates. Those are the three primary things we do. If you do not get those, I hope you will sign up at mailings at vlct.org. I'm sorry that I don't have the screen share for you right now, but I, I'm gonna leave copies of this and I'll send an electronic copy. Mailings at vlct.org, vlct.org. will get you access to all of our things. We are no longer sending you know, a hard copy magazine quarterly. So it's really important that you're watching your inbox. If that's not working for you, I really need to know that. I also have a few other calls to action. One, the loss control program that Kelly's team runs. This is a $10,000 grant program. Have you guys taken advantage of it this year yet, Trevor? Not this year, no. So this year, uh, there's no match requirement. So if you have a loss control thing, if you want to do a cyber assessment, if you've got you know, some issue that one of our loss control experts has pointed out, or you think you have a loss control issue, something to make your town safer, this is the opportunity to get a grant with no match. Uh, we also have a full reimbursement for cybersecurity training and phishing penetration testing. Have you guys used that yet? Gotcha. So we have, a, it, through a partnership with Know Before, it's a cyber assessment, a cyber training, sorry, and then phishing penetration testing. We will fully reimburse the town for subscri subscribing to that to try to help uh, eliminate some of your cyber risks. We need your help signing up for summer legislative committees this year. Uh, we have 
dozens of appointments. We have several permanent appointments as well, like the Opioid Settlement Committee. We have seven appointments to make, local officials. So if you're interested in serving on a committee, look at that wrap-up report because we're going to have the specific opportunities available. And then my final thing is uh, we'd love you to uh, follow us on Facebook <laughs> uh, because, as I said, we're trying to go less print and more digital. And right now, that's the primary social media function that CLCP is using uh, is Facebook. It kind of shows you why I, I have gray hair. So I guess I'm not on Instagram and TikTok yet, but I really ask you to, do, to, to hop on board. Before I, I turn it back over to you, I hope that was only about seven or eight minutes. <laughs> I'm a little over. Kelly, is there anything you'd like to add about uh, the passive side? So passive is obviously our insurance side. I know we have a rich history with you folks with certain <laughs> buildings that rhyme with Ryer Station. <laughs> so I know you. a lot of you know about it, but Kelly, is there anything you'd like to add? You touched on a couple of things I had. Definitely want to make sure I look back. I didn't see any use yet of the grant program from Randolph, so we definitely want to make sure this year is so much better, as Ted said. Yeah, before it was a 50% match to 5,000 this year, we did up to 10,000 but a hundred percent match. Um, and if there's anything you're not sure about that may or may not be eligible, just get in touch with us first, just ask rather than going through paperwork. We wanna make sure everything's efficient. Uh, but yeah, it's really meant for risk management types of things. Um, some towns are putting in um, security cameras, uh, you know, things like that, uh, sprinkler systems even. Um, so $10,000 can go a long ways to help out with things like that. Uh, so definitely, we'd love to see members we'll do that sooner than later if you have anything, because those funds are going quickly. Uh, the note before is what Ted mentioned as well, the, uh, the fishing ER service. Uh, that uh, we really want members to start taking advantage of that. We've only had a select few, I think we've had up to 12 so far, who have capitalized. We have a lot more funds remaining. Uh, and we use it ourselves at the LCT. We get a, a monthly email, just a five to 10 minutes quiz at the end. It's, it's really simple and kind of fun. Um, pictures, easy. <laughs> uh, but it, it focuses on the employee level, which is where we found uh, most of the cyber attacks have happened. People just are busy through their day and hackers are getting better, smarter. They know how to mimic. I get emails from Ted uh, saying he needs me right away and he has an important mission for me. No, you don't. <laughs> so those kinds of things, just teaching people to be really aware of something seems urgent, it seems out of Character, um, it, it just, it's a constant reminder, and it's helping us as well at the LCT to be more knowledgeable. But yeah, again, 100% reimbursement. We do need to make sure I have something I can send you if you want. Um, you have to sign up for the correct one because we negotiated um, a lower rate for this, the diamond level service. Um, to get the full reimbursement, you've got to go through it. We don't want anybody to be mixed on that. So um, overall, it looks like Randolph was trending really good. I look back at the notes. Um, your contribution wise, it's coming down. And as Ted said, we were excited that this last year coming into 2022, we had that additional uh, return. So you guys got back uh, over $31,000 in credits uh, for your contribution. So that's great. We love when we can do those kinds of things for members, give it back however possible, especially if you're performing well, things are going good for you. But I'm on the road too, like Ted, I'm checking to see what members need, what, what what's going on for you guys. Um, what other things can we do on our side as well? We're trying to offer as many services, whether you're calling in or emailing in and sending contracts for review. Um, if you have just general insurance questions, uh, we're here to try and answer those as best as possible, dig in, do some research. We've got Jill on our HR side. She's, she's always there for general HR talks and for trainings again now. She's back into trainings. Uh, and our law school guys are back down the road too, and they're starting to do more trainings as well. So anything we can help, or if you think of other ideas, I've had some members come up with some, some things that either they saw in the past or they'd love to see in the future. Um, we want to hear from you guys what your needs are so we can brainstorm and help us to help you out. So are there any questions? Anything you want me to touch on? Anything you wish I hadn't said? <laughs> <laughs> I have just a couple of items, Ted. Um, do you guys ever follow rulemaking? I know you follow the legislature and you do a good job communicating on that, but what about rulemaking? Yeah, I do think that Karen, so Karen Horn, our 36 year director of advocacy uh, and Gwen Zakoff, I uh, absolutely do follow some rulemaking issues when it clearly is very pertinent to a municipal 
a high priority item. We don't follow them all. Uh, and so if there's something that you folks think we should be following and weighing in on and showing up, please let us know. Is there anything, Trini, in particular? Um, I just learned today that ANR is uh, going through rulemaking to change a lot of their wetland mapping. And that'll have a huge impact on the communities around there, especially if you've got a project going on or, or even some of the property values. Um, if they suddenly become in a wetland that they weren't in a wetland and whatnot, I just, it just kind of the fact that you were on the agenda and that was happening. I was just curious if you guys follow some of that stuff because municipalities wouldn't necessarily know about it unless you have a reason to have it brought to your attention and that can have a huge impact. I do believe that Karen follows, is it ICAR? Is that the committee that makes those rules and passes those rules in the end? It is, yep. So I, I know Karen follows that, but I'll specifically flag that one and uh, circle back to make sure that I'm not overstating how closely we're following that stuff. That's a good call. And, and the other one is we, um, we started down a path researching this with some staff at the league and some staff at financial regulation I don't know, probably three years ago, so pre-TED. And it's the issue that municipalities run into with their fire departments. And we have a lot of people who are volunteers that are in jobs that they don't have workers' comp coverage on. So local farmer, he's the one in town all the time, first one to get to the scene, doesn't take out workers' comp on himself, gets injured at the fire, there's really no coverage for him because his $200 or $400 a year he gets from the town is all that counts towards his worker comp coverage. And so we started having a conversation about how do you get some type of coverage on these folks? And it would be interesting to know how many of them are out there statewide and how you do get something that helps them, you know, they, as your first responders, those are the ones you want at the scene, right? They're the ones still working in town in most cases. Um, and in a lot of cases, they don't, they believe they are covered. Oh, the town's got workers comp on me. What they don't understand is something happens. It's only on what the town pays or whatever somebody pays in for uh, an insurance premium on them. So I, I think it's a bigger issue than just Randolph, but I know we've got two of our stations, more than half of them don't have a workers' comp policy on their normal paying jobs. Yeah, uh, Trini, who are you working with on that? Do you remember? From our so, um, Mike Perchlick was working with me. Um, from financial regulation, and I don't know. I can go back and find the name and get it to you. But it's a it's a topic that I think somewhere in the state we got to take up. And I don't know what the answer is. Is there an AFLAC type policy that you could take out on these folks to help them have something? Is it? And we started looking at that from the perspective of what would it look like if Randolph just took one out to cover their firemen versus any type of um, subsidy or compensation that they get from us. It's not really compensation because it's, it's pennies on the hour, but um, you know, just, you know, what does that look like? And that's a, it's a tough one. Yeah, I do recall seeing some notes on that. And I think, I think Julia was involved originally on the HR side. There were some questions that came through and she deferred over to Fred in our department as well. He's our deputy director. I think some of the hitch actually was some of these sole proprietors who had already um, waived their workers comp um, because they run their own business. Uh, and I think when DFR got involved, it was because they had um, they had actually contractually waived that. Um, we have a number of folks who are volunteer firefighters, but we do have, um, and Randolph does as well, you have the workers' comp through the assigned risk program. So you do have that workers' comp coverage, but I think there might be a select few individuals where that's hanging up. 
and I'll need to dig into that a little deeper with Fred to find out where where the problem lies. Because if if the department weighed in and they they said that we couldn't afford that workers' comp coverage, then unfortunately we do start to run into a sticking point. But like you said, they if they're providing a service for the town and a very high exposure service at that. There certainly needs to be some kind of coverage. Uh, but let me dig into the details and figure out where they got with that because there was only some high-level notes that I found. Um, so I assume there's probably a little bit more to this story. I might want to know all the details first before we comment it. Um, but we'll, we'll keep digging into it and I'll ask Fred tomorrow. Yeah, the big challenge we had was in how workers' comp is calculated. And it's calculated based on wages for which somebody pays worker comp premiums on them. So we'd gotten to the point where we decided it couldn't be a workers' comp policy. It would need to be some other type of coverage that would give some benefit in the event something happened. So it kind of went more onto an accident or, or short-term disability or some type of other plan that wasn't labeled workers' comp. I think that's kind of, that's where we got to and it kind of stalled. Yeah, I'll look into that tomorrow and find out for sure. Because like I said, I, I could tell by a high level note there was more to it. Um, but yeah, I hate to comment incorrectly, um, not knowing all the details, but we'll certainly we'll dig in deeper. I'll let you know when I find out. Great, thank you. Thanks for two good questions, Trini. That's my only two. So it's wide open. Anybody else have any? I do. Sorry. I think this is for you, Ted. Um, when um, when you weigh in on um, legislation, um, some of it's you know from the like unbelievably mundane to like truly profound stuff, and then wonder what kind of process you go through to get to the place where you actually issue like we're for this, we're against this, and here's why. Like, what, how does how does that work? It seems like some some of it's like really big deal stuff and it could be like like some potentially pretty contentious issues in there. Yes, and uh, oftentimes completely unexpected. <laughs> uh, that's the hardest part. So the most important thing is that the league is a nonpartisan, non-political organization. And so we don't take any partisan uh, uh, positions. We take positions based on what our members tell us to. And so every two years, and we're actually in that uh, process right now, we conduct summer study committees, summer uh, uh, policy committees. And we just finished an uh, open call to members to volunteer for those policy committees. We have five different policy committees. I will try my best. We have a finance and regulation uh, policy committee. We have a, a quality of life and housing policy committee and environment policy committee, public uh, safety uh, policy committee, and I believe a transportation policy committee. And members on those five things review last the, the previous year's policy, their, their broad policy positions and say, you know, we support more funding for the bridge, local bridge program. We support, uh, uh, you know, eliminating active 50 jurisdiction in downtowns. And some even higher policy positions, which are, you know, we support local authority in all uh, opportunities that there are. And then we use that as our North Star. And so throughout this summer, we will hold these policy committees again. And if anybody's interested in being on a policy committee, it's not too late. We simply have closed the application period because we didn't think anybody else wanted to join. But if you're interested, please do. Uh, we then spend the summer building these policies and we bring that policy to the full membership to be voted on. That policy is voted on at town fair, which this year is October 6th and 7th, in peak foliage at Killington. And we bring that whole policy to the membership where it can be amended from the floor. It has been amended regularly on the floor, which is a complicated game of elections and uh, uh, parliamentary procedure. And then once the entire group has said, yes, this is what we want, we get a positive vote on it, we use it as our, our North Star. And we try our hardest to base every decision we make in the state house when something comes forward on what that policy document says. In the event that something comes up that we had not thought of, or that we are confused, we being staff, as to whether or not we should take a position one way or the other, we bring it to our board. 
And so like you, uh, the VLCT board really operates like a municipality. I am a very powerless executive director. My board holds that power. And so the board uh, will make a decision and say, yes, uh, you should support this or no, you shouldn't support this based on either what's in the policy, municipal policy, or based on uh, their beliefs that uh, this is what the membership would want. Is that answering the question? Did yeah. I go too long? No, that's great. Thank you. That's very helpful. <laughs> I do mean it. If you're interested in joining one of those committees, we'd love to have you. I'm, I'm on the other side. He's trying hard. <laughs> as as the, one of the local representatives. Yes. So I'm, not, I'm not sure. Being on the on one of the policy committees makes sense. <laughs> Do you have any more questions or comments? Hearing none, thanks for coming down, guys. Thanks, Trini. I'm going to leave copies of the presentation that was the outline for what I spoke about, our 2022 member guide, and the passive annual report here with Trevor. So uh, you can recycle those after I leave. Just don't tell me you did it, so I feel okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the opportunity, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much for having us. All right, next up we have the MRGP grant and aid. The annual authorization for the for us to submit a letter of intent to participate. There's a, a sort of a preset amount that's already designated for us. It's, less than forty-two thousand dollars. They're eighty twenty grants. They're pretty easy to both obtain and administer, and we use them for projects that you could broadly describe as water quality improvements. So we often use them on some of the gravel roads in, in the more rural areas. We're doing one this summer on Howard Hill. We base the candidates on our road erosion inventory, and if you've ever seen that map, there's yellow, green, and and red, and we try to focus on the areas where there are the red segments. It looks at what they call the hydrologically connected roads, so any of the roads where the stormwater could make it into um, some other, you know, directly to about it, it body of water or indirectly and find its way in there. And so we use these improvements like uh, ditching is, is, a, is a big one, um, and sort of turnouts, runouts, um, armoring culverts on either end, you know exit and entry, so those types of things that generally adhere to that sink it, slow it, spread it set of stormwater principles. We've been really successful. The regional planning commissions of two rivers, Rita in particular, help us identify candidates, find our way through the grants, submit for reimbursements. They're, they're a very good part of this. And so we would, this would just be a letter of intent to, to participate that we'd be Asking them to approve tonight, and we'll identify candidates working with Rita based on that road erosion inventory. The early favorite is something up in the area of where Rogers Road and North Randolph Road all come together. That's where there's a couple of different red segments that meet um, in some of these projects, you know, and it kind of continues that work from that Howard Hill corridor off into that section. A lot of our red segments are sort of in that kind of North Randolph. Um, section of the ridge, though they really spread out throughout town. So we've got work in quite a few areas, but that was the initial thought but once we dig into that might be a different thing. And the 20%, I believe, has always been able to be made through in kind. So we'll oftentimes we'll we'll do provide the labor, track time, and operator equipment and then materials. So we supply culverts, we supply rock. That goes toward our 20% match. They're they're I'm generally uh, grant hesitant. But this is one of those programs where they're they're easy to obtain, they're easy to administer, they're easy to have reimbursed, and they make a small project to good impacts. Anybody have any questions or comments? If not, any motions? I'll move that we approve the uh, letter of intent for the MRGP grants and aid participation. Second that. Motion and a second, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 
Motion carries. Assembly permit for first Fridays. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. Stephanie's here uh, on behalf of the event organizers. You had left it after your main meeting that first Friday, number one, first Friday, the first would occur. You'd revisit it um, for making a decision on the subsequent dates in the event series. So this is a return event to see how things went and if that authorization is extended throughout the, the proposed meeting or the proposed event slate. And we've included the original application in the packet. So you can give that out. I don't remember the exact dates, but it's roughly what four Fridays so yeah or so the October is the last one. Yeah. So July first and then August something. There was going to be the reason to extend it was to make sure the parts store was okay because we had nothing from them saying yay or nay and they were potentially going to be looking for alcohol and would need to submit the layout for that and uh, outdoor consumption permit. Those were the two items I think that we had that kept us from giving every Friday. Um, so we decided um, as like what we would like to do instead of having a full on street closed down for the alcohol permit is just have each of them have their own outdoor area that um, so one name's maintaining theirs because the music's down at that end anyways. Um, and then Taco Cat has theirs. I think what Ingrid just came forward with theirs, I believe, for you guys. So it's just like no, what their normal spaces. So we're not modifying anything that doesn't already exist. So we're not adding on anything. If that makes sense. So we don't have then on Merchants Row, we don't have space for one main, correct? They're on the front part. Yeah, they're maintaining what they already have on the main street side um, because the band is on Merchant Store right next to that. So it actually kind of provides a, you know, a viewing area from their current location. So they have no change to what they're, want, they're wanting to make at this point. And what we're thinking is it kind of makes it easier for everyone just because otherwise there's really no state regulation that would allow us to do that. And so one of the restaurants would have to take lead and then we'd have to hire security and then and really what happened was everybody was going inside all the businesses to consume or staying in those areas. And that's what we want is we want people to be attending the businesses and enjoying the community events. So um, everyone was really happy with how it went and they didn't really feel like having like that beer garden atmosphere was really necessary to do so. so. And as far as the park store, it seemed fine. No one said anything to us. And um, I don't know if you guys heard any problems or anything, but. It isn't contacted my office, at least. I don't know if anyone else has heard from me. I didn't hear that. Trevor, was there a complaint or no complaint? Yeah, we haven't heard anything. Um, I don't know if anyone I else. haven't either. Yeah, it's been, it's been quiet. He's not generally bashful. <laughs> Anybody have any questions? Comments? What we're being asked is to grant the same permit as we did before with no changes for the first Friday for the next four months. I'd like to move that we um, that we approve the uh, permits for the next four months for the first Friday event on Merchants Row. I think that. A motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed, same motion carries. Next up is other business. Stephanie. I don't have anything for you. But a manager's report. Uh, maybe a couple of quick ads. We're still working. There may be a way to continue the well 
wells and reservoir projects and start this summer and do some of the critical pieces by essentially splitting the project up into sort of the necessary components and what you can think of as the finished components and that would allow some more time to identify uh, that remaining funding gap contractor put that one forward so we're trying to work that through to see if that's something DGC would would be okay with um, so we still may be able to have something probably closer to late summer fall um, or with the replacement of the reservoir there. Um, we, uh, we've been interviewing frequently this, this week um, for different positions um, and then recreation director primarily. We put together a little hiring committee for that. So we had a quartet there. Um, we're continuing to work to identify candidates for different vacancies. Um, we have some illness related absences, both amongst our sort of our regular folks and even some of our contract people. Um, so that's kept us at, at a bit of a slower pace as well. Um, I think we're strong. We are working to um, the fiscal year closes at the end of the month. And um, when we think about grants, at least in the short term, if we can focus. Um, prep ourselves to take advantage of some of maybe the bigger opportunities that are out there, meaning that we'll, we'll be at a better staffing place at some point. Um, and in between some of these like grants and aid, the, the equipment grants to the league that are a, a little lower hanging fruit but have those kinds of, of um, significant impacts you know, given that they're not so free or financial. I, I just, we have so many of those active in some form uh, reporting to reimbursement requests, um, they're eating up a substantial chunk of time, um, and that has its downstream impact. So, I'm um, beginning to, to do the word out now. I just want to kind of highlight that as we think about we can queue up to take advantage of some of those cycles that that Ted was talking about with some of those other opportunities. Get ourselves staffed up. It all should work fairly seamlessly. Tomorrow's plan is to requisition money type to the Orange County Parent Child Center. <coughs> Six hours to have to go there that point something else goes away. So it's 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 we're trying to keep everything moving, but it's it's the longer this short staffing goes on, the more difficult it is. Um, so we are we are actively trying to fill some of these things, um, but we're, we are trying. It's kind of a I know you all already know this is pre preaching the choir, but if anybody's listening, here's a later, see the later. We, we are trying. We are aware. Just you know, so far, we can travel so fast. That was it. Great. Any questions? Set it for a second. I see also this in the next sidewalk. But yeah, we want to do a, a similar go around. The capital plan has um, conditions that we put some of our sidewalk reserve money into to, to more significant maintenance projects. We try to find a few of those, one of those together and do an RFP with some of the other projects. That are just we just have to identify those candidates. There's some sections you know, on the main drag and we'll try to get out to the main drag that is there in need. Hospital's got some sections that it's patched through and they're in pretty good shape when you when you weigh them against some of our other areas, but certainly aren't in ideal shape either. And but just figuring out what the right mix of those would be. Um, just getting out and walking on the Measuring them with a call the wonder wheel that takes the, the linear measurements and, and, and putting that together. Yeah. Any other questions? If not, we will entertain a two part motion to go into executive session.
looking for that wording. I hope that we find that executive session is necessary and prudent and that premature general public knowledge will place the town at a disadvantage and then move to enter. Do we have to do these separately? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's my first motion. I'll second that. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. The follow up motion is <coughs> the executive session pursuant to 1 BSA uh, 313A 1A contracts and 1 BSA 313A 2 real estate and 1 BSA 313A 1E pending probable application. <laughs> okay, good for you. <laughs> I'll, I'll second what he said. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.